Well, good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started uh, from the South Florida Water Management District uh, headquarters in West Palm Beach, Florida. And the Water Management District um, is the regional flood control agency for over 8 million people here in South Florida. Um, and it was established that way by the legislature. And flood control continues to be uh, a, the core mission of the Water Management District. So why are we here today? First of all, the water levels throughout the district, uh, which is made up of 16 counties in South Florida, are very high after record-breaking rainfall in May. And that includes Lake Okeechobee, which has risen to the level uh, that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has uh, instituted discharges to the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries. And as you know, that has been uh, the, the real news uh, since it started, uh, I think, last Friday. Uh, so we're going to be looking into that. We know that there is not a silver bullet. There's not one single solution that will stop releases from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, but over the long term, the district is making steady progress on ecosystem restoration projects uh, that will reduce the need for these harmful releases uh, in the future and hopefully the near future uh, for us. So let's address the immediate situation that we have today on June 8th. Uh, the, the water managers here at the district are looking for operational refinements to move more water out of Lake Okeechobee south instead of having it going east and west to the estuaries. Uh, we're working closely with our state and our federal partners, the Corps of Engineers, Department of Interior, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and we're looking for any and all flexibility within the regional water management system. Um, now, joining me today, uh, three of my colleagues to start, Chief Engineer John Mitnick. Uh, and John's going to provide an overview of the current district operations, uh, immediate steps we're taking to reduce the burden on our estuaries, uh, while we continue to provide uh, flood protection for our families and businesses. Um, and then uh, Terry Bates, who is our Water Resources Division Director, is going to discuss the ecological conditions based on the data that's been gathered by our scientists uh, who are both on the ground and in the air. And Everglades Policy and Coordination Division Director Ava Velez uh, will look ahead at how our ecosystem restoration projects that are either under construction or being planned, what role they're going to play, and also uh, uh, give you an update on a project that we have which stores water on private farmlands, private property, and public property uh, as a way of uh, diverting water from Lake Okeechobee or into the estuaries. Um, so, John. We're hearing firsthand from people who are directly affected by Lake Okeechobee releases, whether they're on the Caloosahatchee or the St. Louis, uh, St. Lucie estuary. Um, talk first about uh, the conditions that have brought us to this point, which is really devastating for a lot of folks. Yeah, thank you, Randy. I think first off, I'd say to, to those residents that live in those communities, we hear you. Um, we fully understand and appreciate that the discharges to the estuaries are both damaging from an environmental standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint and damaging to those economies in those areas. Um, it's unfortunate that the releases are being made so early in the wet season. Um, we know that the decision made by the Corps of Engineers um, are have been done in order to protect the integrity of the Herbert Hoover Dyke and protect the citizens that live adjacent to the dyke um, has not been made lightly. Um, this is, Randy, this is the third year in a row that uh, Mother Nature has dealt us a bad hand and brought us uh, an, ex an excessive or extreme beginning to the wet season. Um, as I, I presented to uh, the Advisory Commission um, just earlier this week, um, May has brought more than 300% above normal rainfall. We actually set a record for the month of May um, over the past four weeks. So, Randy, that sort of begs the question of what are we doing? Um, 
what I can tell you is the district is aggressively trying to move water out of the conservation area so as to free up room and bring some of that Lake Okeechobee water down to the south. Um, we're moving water to tide through the East Coast canals, but keeping in mind that we still need to provide flood protection for those residents that live along the lower East Coast of Florida in Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties. We've been coordinating with our federal partners to find more flexibility in how the system is operated, and we have to rely on them to do things because it lies within their authority to be able to do them. We've asked to be able to open up all of the S-12 water control structures to move more water out of Water Conservation Area 3A into Everglades National Park. We've asked them to raise the operating level for the L-29 canal that it sits along Tamiami Trail. Um, we've asked for the construction that's currently ongoing in the southern part of the system to be wrapped up so we can hopefully fully operate the system, as well as all of this is being done in order to bring more water south. In the end, like you said, there's really no silver bullet. Um, but that's why the district is continuing to move forward with the C-44 project, uh, the C-43 reservoir over on the west coast, also the Lake Hikpachee project water storage area um, over on the west coast. In addition, it's why we've moved forward with the EAA project as part of Senate Bill 10. And we're looking to advance the construction of the S-333 north structure, again, all to bring more water out of the water conservation area and open up that southern end of the system. As you know, the state is focused on getting the Corps to finish the repairs to the Herbert Hoover Dyke, so the Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule, as well as the adaptive protocols, um, can be revisited, and we look to find any and all flexibility in addressing these issues that we're experiencing now. In addition to those things, we're also continuing to develop a deep injection well program for Lake Okeechobee management. And lastly, Randy, we've coordinated with the landowners and the private partners to hold as much water as they can where they can. And, and that's a good segue into Ava's uh, portion of this. Um, can, Ava, can you update us on uh, you know, what, what is the status of storing water on private properties and, and public lands? And we call it our uh, dispersed water management uh, system. Uh, explain how it works, what its benefits are, and what our status is right now. Sure thing, Randy. Thank you for the opportunity to, to highlight those efforts. I wanted to start by mentioning that we have many efforts uh, to remedy the unintended consequences of the central and southern flow control system, and those are extensive. The long-term ones that are under construction that Don just mentioned uh, that are north of the lake, like Lakeside Ranch, uh, east of Lake Okeechobee, the C-44, or west, our C-43. We also do long-term planning projects for storage north of the lake, south of the lake, and to the west and to the east. But where our partnerships with our landowners, our agricultural landowners, come in are in the near term. We have well-established partnerships with ranchers as well as citrus growers in the Lake Okeechobee watershed, in the St. Lucie watershed, as well as the Caloosahatchee. And, and those projects are both passive, which means that they hold the rainfall that falls on that property for the benefit of the regional system, so they hold that water back from ever reaching the lake or the estuaries, or they can also hold that rain as well as pump water from, for example, the St. Lucie Canal, the C44, they could pump water from there and hold it on their property, and then it doesn't ever reach the estuaries. And so I'm happy to report our team has assessed all those projects that we have in those three watersheds. They are all active. We have about 54,000 acre feet of storage available across those three watersheds. They are at about 70% capacity as a result of the May rains, but they're still working and will continue to be operational in the coming days as the season continues. Great. Thank you, Ava. And uh, just, uh, I forgot to mention this at the start, uh, that you can uh, email me questions. I think you saw the email address that was on our uh, media advisory. Uh, we've got a couple of folks in here that can ask some questions um, uh, just as soon as we're finished. And we'll move now to, uh, let's talk about the, the ecology uh, and what happens when these massive releases uh, are made from Lake Okeechobee. What happens to the estuaries? What are we seeing out there now? And of course, uh, the blue-green algae 
is, is no doubt you've seen the headlines about that because that is uh, a major concern for us. Uh, as you look back to 2016 with the issues that we had with the algae, um, Terry Bates is going to give us uh, an overview of what our folks have been seeing uh, and kind of the role that South Florida Water Management District plays uh, in um, uh, um, an outbreak of blue-green algae uh, in, in our system. Terry? Sure, Randy. And I'm going to show some graphics because that's probably the easiest way to share the information. Okay, so as John mentioned, the tremendous amount of rainfall we're dealing with in May, we had record-setting rainfall across the district, and a lot of that is all discharging to the estuaries. So to give you a sense on the right-hand side, here's a graphic that depicts that rainfall in May. Again, areas on the East Coast have had more than 300% of what we would consider normal rainfall. And starting on the west coast in the uh, C43 area, more than 200% of rainfall. All of that discharge is ultimately down to the Caloosahatchee estuary. And the graphic on the left, you can see the area to the west of Lake Okeechobee. That's about a half million acres that all eventually drains through S79 and comes out to the estuary. So we know that there's a lot of reports of brown water in the estuary making its way out to the Gulf because that's all of that huge uh, watershed that is draining through that part of the system. So I'll walk you through this graphic for the Caloosahatchee estuary. This basically shows the amount of flow that the estuary is receiving. So up from, on the left-hand side, from April through May, there were periodic releases being made actually to the benefit of the estuary to try and help maintain the beneficial salinity levels. And so the, the areas shown in blue are discharges that the Corps of Engineers has made for the benefit of the estuary. When those rains really started in mid-May, those releases uh, substantially slowed down or stopped from the lake. And what you see in the blue and the green here, these colors, are the tremendous amount of flows coming from the watershed. So the gray here is reflecting runoff from that half million acres in the C43 watershed up in the upper right-hand corner, this very large area. And then the green are the tidal basins, those areas downstream of S79 that also discharge to the estuary. And then as the core initiated releases to the lake, you can see here from the lake, you can see this area in blue is when the core started those releases coming back to the estuary. So that's added to all of that runoff that's already coming from the watershed. So tremendous flows going to the Caloosahatchee estuary. Certainly folks on the west coast are, are seeing the effects of that. From an ecological standpoint, as soon as we hit those heavy, heavy rainfall, the salinity levels, which is the graphic I'm showing here on the right, basically you try and maintain uh, salinity levels for the benefit of oysters and seagrass and fisheries. And when you get that big flux of fresh water, those salinity levels drop dramatically. And that has a significant impact. And both the estuaries we're going to talk about today, the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie, were significantly impacted by discharges in 2016 from Hurricane Irma. And so they've been working to try and recover. And this is just another setback to those estuaries to have those freshwater conditions return. So a similar graphic for the St. Lucie estuary. You can see, again, the rainfall graphic here on the left. And just tremendous rainfall in St. Lucie and Martin County over the course of a, a short 30-day period. And in the case of the St. Lucie, there are multiple basins here that all drain to the estuary, regardless of anything coming from Lake Okeechobee. So for most of the month of May, it was the C44 basin, C23, C24, 10 Mile Creek, and the tidal basins that were all discharging stormwater runoff from roads and residential developments and agricultural areas coming into this fairly small area of the St. Lucie estuary. And the consequence of that, you can see, again, similar graphics showing flows reaching the estuary. 
And as we come across there, there was no discharges coming from Lake Okeechobee. And there hasn't been since January in the St. Lucie estuary. And then as those May rains picked up, significant runoff coming from C44 basin, but more significantly the C24, C23 basins, and then also the tidal basins. So a tremendous amount of discharge from those local basins coming in. And the graphic here on the right, you can see that very immediate response from the salinity in the estuary. So it's turned that estuary fresh, completely fresh. And then we've started uh, the core released releases from Lake Okeechobee are this small area here shown in blue. So proportionally, the discharges coming from the lake to the estuary at this point are relatively small. Uh, but the impact on the estuary overall is from all the rainfall that's already turned to a freshwater condition. So again, both of these estuaries have already been struggling to recover from oysters and seagrass and the fisheries because of the previous rainfall events. So I know blue-green algae blooms are on everybody's mind. I know I was at the gym uh, yesterday morning and every screen, I'm on the treadmill, there's 10 TV screens and every single one of them is showing these horrendous mats of blue-green algae in the estuary. They're all showing pictures from 2016. So for folks that have seen that, th those were the events in 2016. That's not what we have out there today. And so I want to just share what we've been seeing and tell you how we respond on the, the blue-green alga, alga blooms. All of our agencies work together, the Department of Environmental Protection, the district, the health department, the fish, Florida Freshwater Fish Commission, we all work together to respond when we've got these bloom conditions. DEP takes the lead. Um, they've got a very handy link that you can see here on their website, a phone number that you can call for residents. If you're seeing blue-green algae, you can report it to DEP. They respond by either going out and sampling or requesting that the Water Management District um, collect those samples. Because even though you may be seeing visible algae, it's not necessarily toxic. That's what you always hear about toxic blue-green algae. But not all algae is toxic, and you have to test it to make that determination. So the DEP will do that testing, and then they provide centralized reporting of that information for the public. The local health departments are the entities that would issue any health advisories um, if necessary. And we know there are already some in the St. Lucie estuary that predated any releases from the lake. And that's really from that local watershed and uh, fecal coliforms in the water. So the health department issues those types of advisories. The commission will respond to fish kills. We've not had any reports of that. And then the district is continuing our efforts to sample across Lake Okeechobee, very large area, about 730 square miles, so it's a big area to cover. And then we also respond where DEP has requested. So this is a, a picture from DEP's website. It's a very easy to use uh, web-based application where you can click on each of those dots where the department has sampled collected samples based on uh, reports coming in, and then they will report the data as far as the type of algae and whether any toxins have been detected. The first reports came back from the department that were just posted, uh, I believe, late last night. Very, very low levels of toxins detected, um, and so that information is reported here, and that was from, I believe, a single location. So I want to share one of the tools that we use. We've been monitoring to, to look for potential bloom conditions across the lake, especially after Hurricane Irma caused significant impacts in the lake as far as nutrient levels as well as turbidity. And so one of the things that we rely on, as do other agencies, are satellite images. And these come in every week. We get a satellite image, uh, and there are a color-coded key here that gives you a sense for whether there's a potential bloom. And that's basically based on uh, the pigment of the algae is reflected and calculated to determine whether there's potential bloom across the lake. So we've been monitoring this first graphic is from January, February, March, not seeing anything across the lake. Uh, when you see these gray areas, that's basically cloud cover where you didn't necessarily get a clear image. And this is from May. You saw some little dots here along the edge, and that's not uncommon. If you do have any algae forming, it typically blows up against the shoreline. But the most recent data is from June 2nd, so a very clear image of Lake Okeechobee with the exception of this little cloud cover here, really not seeing any bloom conditions across the lake. 
And that's not to say there might not be some isolated areas, but at least as of June 2nd, nothing of significance. And to put that in context for you, this is a comparison of a bloom condition in June 2016. And in that case, for several months across the entire lake, we were seeing this, you know, just red hot yellow oranges indicating very intense algal blooms across the lake. So on the left here is your comparison of the conditions in the lake from June 2016 to where we are today in 2018. So very, very different conditions than we experienced in 2016. And that's as of to date. Uh, one of the things that's very difficult with dealing with blue-green algae is knowing what the triggers are. So we've got a long, hot summer to get through, so there's no crystal ball to determine are we gonna have a significant bloom or not, but we have very good tools to be out there to monitor those conditions and get an early indication if we see bloom formation. Now there have been small areas of visible algae reported, certainly by residents along um, the St. Lucie area. And it's not uncommon, algae, these algae float to the surface and they're buoyant. So typically what happens, the wind will kind of push them around and they tend to push them against the shoreline or adjacent to a structure where you're not having a lot of flow and you can get some of this surface accumulation. So this is a location um, just north of Pahokee where DEP conducted water quality sampling um, just earlier this week. And then the photograph on the right is actually our district scientists were out and you can see some visible algae here in Lake Okeechobee. But on the scale of the overall lake, relatively small areas. We did have our staff go out on the St. Lucie Estuary yesterday and they did a really full scale reconnaissance going all the way from the locks where water enters the estuary from the Lake Okeechobee at Port Mayaka and running a transect all the way out to the St. Lucie Inlet and then also up to the northern portion of the St. Lucie. And what they do is they collect data continuously. This picture here on the lower uh, left-hand side is the equipment that's installed in the water and it's just constantly taking samples so that we'll basically get a whole kind of a road map of the estuary from one end of the estuary to the other and get a good sense for what are we seeing as far as chlorophyll levels and salinity levels across the estuary. They didn't report any visible algae as they were running those transects. Um, that's not to say there might not be some along the shoreline behind some quiet uh, boat basins, but overall throughout the estuary, they weren't seeing any significant algae. And with that, I'll turn it back to Randy. Uh, thanks, Terry. And unfortunately, this, this makes, uh, you know, this is certainly not the first time we've been in this situation. Uh, it uh, occurs all too frequently, but uh, Ava, in, in the case of the projects that, uh, you know, like our reservoir projects, like the EAA reservoir project, which is, uh, you know, being expedited, this, it, situations like this that make it even more important to, to keep the, the fuel going on these projects, to, to get them done uh, it, it's as soon as we possibly can. Would you agree with that? I would. I think that it's important, you know, when we have these events, it helps us reflect on the importance of these long-term projects. They are large infrastructure projects that need our investment, but they're worth it. And events like what we have now, where we know that as we continue to be committed to that progress of Everglades restoration, which includes significant infrastructure projects like a reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee or the C44 or C43, what they help is especially with that resiliency of our estuaries. It gives them time to breathe in between those events. Uh, it reduces the duration of those high events. And that's where we see the biggest benefit of these long-term investments. And John, let's go back to operations and, and you know, I mean, we are in the, uh, the business of moving water. We've got equipment, uh, we've got canals, the Water Management District does. Uh, and I know that this agency is not content to just sit back and, and let things uh, happen without putting uh, a lot of emphasis on what else can we do. I saw us do this in 2016, is uh, get very creative with the, the operations and maintenance crews. I mean, temporary pumps, 
you know, diversions. I, where are we on that? Are, are we're, we're likely looking at whatever we can do to move water uh, as much to the south as we can. Yeah, Randy, absolutely. Uh, just as we did back in 2016 and even last year in 2017, um, we currently have some temporary pumps deployed in the southern portion of the system and we're utilizing them. Um, we're looking to mobilize additional pumps in other parts of the system to try to help getting as much water out because every little drop that you're able to move out of the system will free up some capacity to start moving that water down towards the south and out to the bottom. Good. Well, I, I thank you all. Did we have any questions from... And, and you just tell it to me, and I'll repeat it so everyone else can hear what it was. So the, the question was, uh, you know, we, we said we're 300% of average rainfall. Uh, you know, wh where do we go from here? What, what, what are we going to do? Do we wait until, you know, it stops raining? Or what, what, how, do, how do we move forward uh, uh, at this point? Um, no, I'd say no, we don't wait till it stops raining. Uh, we, we've been moving a lot of water through the system since the middle of May, since it started raining in those extreme rainfalls starting on May 16th. We've been trying to open up all the outlets and get that water off the landscape. Um, I'll talk about in one particular area here in Palm Beach County, um, over in the western communities in the L8 Basin. Um, that's an area that typically, because it's so far to the west, it has to wait for some of the eastern areas um, from Village of Wellington, Royal Palm Beach, those areas to drain first before they're allowed to start moving that water. Um, what we've done in that case, we, we have a newer storage feature out in the western communities, the L8. FEB or a flow equalization basin. Um, we've been moved a lot of water and pretty much filled up that. We added somewhere on the order of 15 to 20 feet into that storage facility. Um, so what we're doing over the last three days, where I'll say it's been a little bit drier, it has not stopped raining. You can hear the thunder in the background probably here today. Um, it's raining outside right now where it hasn't stopped raining, but have drier weather and not as much or as persistent rain, what we've been trying to do is move those waters in between those rain events so it doesn't stop when the rain stops. We continue our operations and we look for those, those breaks in the rainfall patterns to be able to move as much water through the system and get water that's out to the west through the east coast canals and out to tide. Yeah, so the question is, is Mother Nature our enemy at this point with, uh, you can either have extremely hot weather, which uh, is, is known to, to further the blooms, or you can just have a tremendous amount of water. And I'll let Terry answer that. Sure, and when it comes to the algae boom, that's one of the things that's so challenging is you really can't predict. Um, we know conditions are certainly prime for an algal bloom because Hurricane Irma, as it came across Lake Okeechobee, it stirred up a lot of the nutrients in the lake. So we know that nutrient levels across Lake Okeechobee are fairly high. It also has had pretty high levels of turbidity. So we're heading into those summer months where you have very long days, hot temperatures. Um, so there certainly is a potential for a significant bloom on the lake. But we've had these same conditions before when a bloom doesn't occur. So it's just really hard to predict. And that's one of the things that's important that we're able to monitor those conditions so we can react to them as they are potentially developed. Yeah, so. So, so we're in hurricane season. We, you, you know, we described the, uh, the month of May and the record rainfall. And the question is, how does that, uh, the results of May, set us up as we're early into the hurricane season, John? Yeah, as I said earlier, I mean, given that this is 
day one, so to speak, of the wet season. Uh, it started a little bit earlier this year, back in the month of May. Um, but looking forward, and, and that's why with having the system so full as it is right now, um, it's important and we are staying persistent in, in keeping that water moving and freeing up that capacity as we go through because um, we've still got the rest of the wet season to move on through. Um, there's, there's a saying, if you start high, you end high, so to speak. So we're, we're trying to do and move as much water out of the system so we're not starting that high. And I know that's not um, satisfactory to some folks. It's not something that they really want to hear. Um, but the district is doing everything that it possibly can to move as much water out of the system as every drop that we are able to move out of the system helps for those future rainfalls. And I've actually got one question that was emailed in, and uh, this person would like for us to go back when you were talking about we've been seeking permission uh, to, to make some modifications to operations uh, in the south so that we can move water out of the water conservation areas uh, into the park. Uh, what, uh, to paraphrase, I mean, what, what is stopping us from doing that now? Well, as I said, a lot of that um, uh, authority lies within the federal government. Um, so we, we've been um, leaning on and working with the Corps of Engineers and the Department of Interior to, to allow us to open up the S-12 structures and move a lot of that water out of the Conservation Area 3. It also gets back to raising the operating levels of the L-29 Canal, which runs just north of Tamiami Trail. Both of those things help move more water out of the conservation areas that then allow you to free up that capacity and bring more water down from Lake Okeechobee. Good. Uh, any further questions here? Um, I mean, we're just beginning to lay those discharges. That's with the Army Corps of Engineers. I know that they, they're the ones that control that. But in a typical season, how many discharges would you guys normally see versus how many do you think we're planned for? There's, there's... So the, the question is that uh, they, they understand that it's U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that's in charge of the regulatory schedule for the lake, and they make the discharges. You know, how, how might this year compare for uh, what, if there is such a thing, an average year of discharges might be? I guess just talking in terms of averages, um, if you look over, say, the past 41 years, um, where we are today is about a foot higher than we are on average for this time of year. Um, now, I know that doesn't probably mean a whole lot to a lot of people, um, but as I said, the, some of the decisions that the, the Corps of Engineers has had to make, they haven't taken lightly, and it's being done to protect the integrity of the Herbert Hoover Dyke and those citizens that live around it. Well, great. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, that uh, has been a part of this. Um, it's our commitment to the Water Management District. We're, we're going to maintain uh, very open communications with, with our public, our citizens, uh, as, as we go through the situation. And honestly, I, I don't think anybody expects the situation to improve uh, rapidly. Um, uh, and it's probably going to be a, a, a long wet season for us. But, uh, you know, it's our commitment that I will try to do uh, forums like this as often as I can during this wet season, uh, certainly to update you on the ecological conditions, what John's doing with the operations, and uh, what, what our project progress is from, from Ava's group. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, and have a uh, good weekend.